All right, um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, um, well, first we will continue our kind of our reading and our study of the Upaya Sutra. Although we're not actually going to deal too much with the sutra tonight, um, we're going to deal with the topic, we're going to deal with the theme, but I'm not going to read so much from the sutra. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors lately, you know that we've been reading this Upaya Sutra, a Mahayana Sutra, and you know that we've gotten to a point in the sutra where it's describing these series of unfortunate events that happened to the Buddha. And these are nine, actually in our sutra, it's 10, but these events that have been a part of the Buddhist tradition for a very long time. And I'm sure I've mentioned this in Dharma Door's past, but these nine or 10 unfortunate things that happened to the Buddha, um, like getting his foot pricked with a thorn and like going begging and not getting anything offered to him in the kind of original form of Buddhism, like the kind of the old school Buddhism, these unfortunate events, they were usually taught or they were explained to sort of humanize the Buddha. Like they were sort of like, for example, tonight, we're going to be talking about the time that the Buddha got a headache and the time the Buddha got a backache. <laughs> and originally, these were teachings to say, even the Buddha gets a headache, even the Buddha gets a backache. And so they were sort of used as these teaching devices to, again, humanize the Buddha and say, even he gets pricked by thorns every now and then. But it's the way that the Buddha reacts to these unfortunate events that makes a Buddha a Buddha. Now, but that's the early form of Buddhism where these stories come from. And in the sutra that we've been reading, it's actually kind of doing the exact opposite. Rather than humanizing the Buddha, they're actually elevating the Buddha to like kind of a beyond state in that way. Now, I already sort of talked about in the first, when we started getting into this portion of the sutra, I already started talking about like that they're not really putting the Buddha outside of the world, but they are sort of putting the experience of enlightenment as being transcendent, as being outside the world. So I've already kind of dealt with that. So I don't want to go kind of go down that road tonight. And like I said, we're not really even going to read much of the sutra. And I'll tell you why. So we've come to a point, And if you have the book, The Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, I'm on page 462. And here's the theme for tonight. So the theme is the Buddha's backache and the Buddha's headache. But we're actually going to talk about something in particular. So what happens is, is that the question, and if you remember, these are all po uh, posed in the form of a question, like, why did the Buddha get a headache? Why did the Buddha get struck with a thorn? And here, the question is, why did the Buddha say to the elder Kashyapya, my back is aching. You discourse on my behalf on the seven factors of enlightenment. When he was explaining discipline on the 15th day of the month. So why did the Buddha say to Kashyapa, you teach on my behalf, I've got a backache. So the answer is, well, at that time, sitting in the assembly, were 8,000 gods who subdued themselves with the Shravaka doctrine. These gods had been taught by Mahakashyapa 
in their past lives. And they took refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and they did not lose their self-control. They had often heard the monk Kashyapa explain the seven factors of enlightenment. Except for monk Kashyapa, no one could have made those gods understand the Dharma, not even hundreds of thousands of Buddhas. At that time, Kashyapa explained the seven factors of enlightenment in detail to the gods. And after they had heard the Dharma explained by Kashyapa, they acquired clear Dharma eyes. Yeah, let's, let's pause there. I'll finish it there. But what's going to happen, though, is that I'm going to give a discourse on the seven factors of enlightenment because I think it's a really important topic. And so I'm going to play the role of Kashyapa tonight and give this discourse to the numerous gods in the audience. Um, and I'll have more to say about the upaya of all of this in a little bit, but I do want to spend a little bit of time, pretty much like the majority of this evening, I would like to spend talking about this idea of the seven factors of awakening, as they're called. It's a, it's a teaching that you, you hear a lot about, but you don't always necessarily hear it taught in that way. And so let's get into it. So the first thing, of course, is we need to deal with this like idea or this word. Let's forget about the fact that there's seven of these for the moment. And what we are talking about are what are called the bodha yanga. B-O-D-H-Y-A-N-G-A, Bodhiyanga, and bod, Bodhiyanga is a compound term. It has two parts. The first part of that word is Bodhi, awakening or enlightenment. And then the second part of that word is Anga. And the word or the root, that root, anga, it means a limb, like an arm, or like in a tree, the limbs of the tree are the are anga. And the word anga sort of means, again, like an appendage. It sometimes gets translated as branch but it also sometimes gets translated as member. And the idea is, is that that word anga appears in words like sangha. So the term sangha, like the community, is a combination of sam, which means coming together, and anga, sangha. And it's all of the members coming together. So that's the idea of a sangha. There's a word, uh, well, I could, I could mention a lot of different words that have this as its root. So these are the limbs or the branches or the members of bodhi, of awakening. And I'm kind of easing us into this because I want you to know that this teaching that we're going to get into tonight about these seven aspects, let's just go with that for a moment, the seven aspects of enlightenment, the seven aspects of awakening. So we're going to talk about these seven aspects, these seven factors, and I want you to know that these are part of the oldest Buddhist tradition. So this, the seven factors of awakening is not some Mahayana new additional idea. It's a very old idea. It's, uh, it's an idea that appears in some of the oldest suttas. So some of the oldest teachings. And it also becomes a central part 
of what is known as the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification. But what you need to know about the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification, if you've heard of that term, it's also a book, it's a text. If you've heard of that, it's a part of the early Buddhist tradition, but it's a commentarial tradition. It's part of what they would call the Abhidharma. And I'm telling you this because there is a kind of a, a disagreement. It's a slight disagreement within the sutta tradition, like the way that this idea appears in the suttas versus the, versus the way that it appears in the commentarial literature. It's a very slight difference, but I kind of want to present it this way because I actually think that this is helpful for learning this. So the difference between these two traditions in talking about these seven factors of awakening or seven factors of bodhi, according to the sutta tradition, these are the seven things that get you awakened. These are the seven aspects that if you cultivate them will, will lead to awakening. Whereas in the commentarial uh, tradition, these are the seven things that signify awakening. In other words, these are seven qualities of an awakened person. So those are two different ways to look at this. And I would encourage you all to be good Buddhists and not settle on one of these as right or wrong, but be willing to entertain both possibilities at the same time. So let's keep that in mind that as we go through these tonight, we can either think of them as things that will get you enlightened or aspects of being enlightened. And I'm going to talk about them in both ways, so you, you don't need to remember that entirely, but I just want you to know that I'm going to kind of go back and forth between these two traditions, and as usual, I'll probably bring in some Mahayana teachings as well, and so we're really going to kind of explore these ideas. By the way, just uh, for clarity and simplicity's sake, let me tell you what the seven factors of awakening are. That way you could maybe write them down if you want, if you don't know them, and then we'll go through them all. By the way, lists vary. The order, I've seen the order of the seven factors as coming in different orders. And a, a word about that, before I even tell you what they are, I want to remind you that the word Anga, as in bodhi yanga, the limbs of awakening, I want to remind you that you can think of these and they are described as being like the, the limbs of a tree, the branches of a tree. So the tree of enlightenment, the bodhi tree, has seven branches. And what I want you to be thinking about in terms of a tree with branches if you saw a tree with seven branches, does one of those branches come first? <laughs> like, is there a priority to the branches? Not really. I mean, I guess maybe, you know, if you've tended that particular tree since it was a little sapling, you might know which branch appeared first and which branch appeared second. But I mean, if you just came across a tree, to be thinking of the limbs as having any kind of priority or order, it doesn't really make sense. And I approach the seven factors of awakening or the seven limbs of enlightenment, I approach them as not having any particular order. Some people do, and I will mention a place where that's maybe significant. But otherwise, the normal list or the list that I'm used to, the first factor is mindfulness. 
And I'm going to be using only Sanskrit words tonight. But if at any point anybody really wants the Pali word, just ask me. <clears throat> if I know it off the top of my head, I'll share it with you. But the first factor is mindfulness, which in Sanskrit is smrti. In Pali, that is sati, S-A-T-I. The second factor is investigation of dharmas. Dharma vichaya, V-I-C-A-Y-A, so investigating dharmas. The third is virya, virya, drive, determination, energy, that's virya. The fourth is joy, uh, uh, pleasure, uh, priti or piti in Pali, priti. P-R-I-T-I -I in Sanskrit. Number five is translated as tranquility. This is prashrabdhi. Prashrabdhi. And then concentration, which is a translation of samadhi. And the seventh factor or the seventh limb of awakening is upeksha which tonight we're going to deal with properly in that way. Normally, upeksha might be translated as equanimity, but tonight we're going to deal with it in its proper translation, which is relinquishment, letting go. That's upeksha in that way. So those are the seven factors of enlightenment. And now let's go through. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this tonight, the reason why I was like, ooh, ooh, good, S seven factors of enlightenment, this will be fun. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I kind of wanted to talk about the nature of enlightenment, like the nature of awakening, like insofar as, insofar as we have been talking about the bodhisattva path, and that's kind of what we've been talking about now for months and months and months, like, what is it to be a bodhisattva? Well, a bodhisattva is bound for bodhi, is bound for Buddhahood, is therefore bound for awakening. And so tonight, we are talking about what that means. <laughs> like, what does it mean to be awakened? And again, these are the seven qualities that either get you awakened or constitute awakening. So let's start with the first one. So the first one, in terms of this list, um, this one might be the most familiar to all of us. It's kind of the most common, I would say, of this whole list. Um, you know, samadhi and upeksha are kind of equally talked about in that way. But so smriti, mindfulness. This, of course, is what would be called meditation, but we have to be careful with our words because, of course, Buddhism has a lot of terms for meditation because in Buddhism, especially in Buddhism, there isn't really just one mode of, quote, meditation. And so it's always a little tricky of do we call, do we call sati? meaning shmurti, do we call this meditation or do we call samadhi meditation? Because they're two different states. They're two different kind of states of mind in a way. So which one do we call meditation? Well, the normal translation, of course, of sati or shmurti is mindfulness. And I always like to, you know, inform everybody, if you don't know, that the word sati Shmurti, it actually means to recall or to remember. And I think that that's important to know when you are doing mindfulness, when you are focusing on an object and sort of anchoring your attention, it's kind of important to know that the muscle that you're exercising is one of remembrance. And I wanted to share something with you as a way of thinking about mindfulness. It's a little like, it's a thing I've been doing recently. 
um, recently, meaning like the past many years. But it's kind of just, it's a very personal little practice I do that I believe is a kind of cultivation of mindfulness, a cultivation of, of sati or shmurti. And what it is, is um, it's, I actually, it's hard to explain because it's kind of, I, I do this in a lot of different ways, but an example would be a sort of like, if you, if you left something on the oven or left something on the range, on the stove. And so I won't, I'll spare you the details of why I would do this, like why I started doing this. There's more circumstances to all of this. But it was about, a, so one circumstance would be I put something on the stove and it's boiling, let's say, and it will boil away. And I, there's kind of a risk, of course, if I, if I leave it unattended, but I have to go do something. And so I will remember, don't forget, <laughs> that thing is on the stove, right? And now I go and, you know, I got to write a couple emails or whatever, or I got to attend to the cat, or I got to do something, or I got, but all the while I'm being mindful, I'm remembering, don't forget, don't forget that that thing is on the stove. Now, the thing about it is, is that there's a risk. There's a risk here. This is like high stakes meditation, because if I forget about that thing on the stove, it there's like, there's a risk in that. And so what I'm getting around to is that it's a very interesting mental exercise to try to stay mindful of something. And you know what happens? You start writing that email and your mind starts thinking about, oh, this, this, and that. And you will forget that you put that thing on the stove. And so, again, I, I'm not suggesting you do this. What it is, is that I was in situations where I had to leave the thing on the stove and I had to go away. And when I lodged it in my mind to not forget, I kind of realized, oh, this is sati. This is shmurti. This is a type of, of mindfulness practice where, and, and in, in particular, the mindfulness is about that risk of being distracted and forgetting entirely about the thing that was on the stove. Now, again, I'm not encouraging anybody set up booby traps to try to <laughs> meditate better or anything like that. But what I am suggesting is that you can think about that. You can think about that scenario and then you can just bring it to being mindful of the breathing. And the idea of, you know what? For the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna be mindful of my breathing. And I'm gonna notice every inhalation, every exhalation until I get distracted, <laughs> until my mind wanders. And then I've left the thing on the stove. I've left it boiling away in that way. And so there's a way in which, again, mindfulness is about remembering that, that you're meditating. Remember that you are focusing on your breathing or remember you are focusing on your sensations or whichever of the four foundations of mindfulness you are meditating upon in that way. But I just wanted to share that with you as kind of a way to kind of really tangibly think about what is sati or what is shmurti and why, why are the Buddhists talking about remembering? Because it's really actually an interesting aspect of mindfulness, an exercise of memory in that way. But remember, it's not like recalling something from the past type of a memory. It's more of remembering the activity that you are engaged in versus being distracted or mindless in that way. So now what we can do is we can talk about the first 
factor of awakening in those two different ways, which is you can either look at it as the cultivation and the practice of mindfulness leads to awakening, leads to bodhi. Or you can look at it as a Buddha, an awakened being, is mindful. But I want to say a little bit more about that idea. Because ultimately what I'm kind of wanting to do tonight is I really want to, like, I really want to talk about the goal of Buddhism, this idea of being an awakened being. And there's a way in which I want to kind of demystify that a little bit. But at the same time, I also kind of want to mystify it a little bit. And what I mean by that is, is that what I, I guess what I want to say is, is I want to be thinking about a kind of a classic bell curve tonight. And the idea is, is that on one side of the bell curve of awakening, which is to say not awakened at all, <laughs> one side of the bell curve is being 100% totally distractible. Total, no, constant, no focus or concentration at all to the point where anything and everything, it, it's like in the middle of a sentence, it's like, whoa, what was that? Wait, what was I talking about? Wait, who are you again? Like just utter absent-mindedness. And again, the real key is completely distractible. The slightest noise, the slightest whatever disturbs the mind. And in an uncontrollable way, the mind is like, ooh, what's that? Oh, wait, what's that? What's that? And being led by stimuli. So that's at one end of the bell curve utter distractibility. Then, you know, there's kind of like the, the, the big middle part of the bell curve where many of us have developed a degree of attention, a degree of mindfulness, where for, you know, certain periods of time, maybe under certain lighting conditions and whatnot, we, we are able to be mindful. We're a little distractible, but we can cultivate mindfulness. And so we're kind of in the middle of the bell curve. I want to describe a Buddha, an awakened being, as being always mindful. Meaning very in charge of the mind. And really only, never being distracted, like uncontrollably distracted, always being able to direct one's attention where one wants to put it in that way. And so the process of cultivation, of the, the, the idea of practicing, is to understand what makes us distractible and understand what practices or cultivations develop that steady mind, that what they, in Buddhism, they call the malleable mind. It's very, you know, you can put it in a position and it's gonna stay there. So that's the idea of the first factor of awakening. And again, you can look at it as a cultivation or a practice that leads to enlightenment, or as a quality of an enlightened person, that they are mindful in that way. Yeah? Yeah, no. Um, I think that I really like the example you gave for understanding why, how mindfulness could be, could, you know, how remembering is a synonym or is another way of, of understanding mindfulness. And and I know you weren't advocating we we do the uh, 
the the, <laughs> the stove leaving things on the stove experiment i've done that a few times it doesn't <laughs> work out well yeah. um, but i'm thinking about it there's almost like there are instructions i think if i understand them correctly from many teachers including i'm thinking of like Thich Nhat Hanh's gatas you know where he's like when i'm cooking beans i am cooking beans like we don't it's not like Buddha's multitask. Maybe they do. I don't know. But they attend to one thing at a time. And that's, so, you know, when we're sitting in meditation, of course, we intend to follow the breath and suddenly we're deep in thought and then we realize it. But in day to day, uh, cultivating mindfulness, part of it is to not try to cook beans and write emails and do something else. Is, it, and is that okay? excellent? Excellent, Noam. You really, you really uh, drove the point home, um, which is sort of, I wanted to take mindfulness away from meditation in a formal setting. And exactly, I wanted to talk about it in a way where we could be cultivating it all the time. And I think that that's a great example that if you're cooking dinner, be cooking dinner <laughs> and be mindful. If you're chopping carrots, be mindful of each chop and remember to be right there and uh, 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 know exactly that the, the possibility of distractions are right there to forget that I'm chopping carrots and whoops, <laughs> cut my finger. Whereas I don't think a Buddha is going to slip and cut their finger accidentally through mindlessness. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Connie. Hi. Hi. Um, hey. Hey. Hello. Um, so my question refers a little bit to Noam's question in, in a certain sense. Um, what I've been experiencing, and I, I read it somewhere, but I can't remember in the text, but it was a while ago. So when we cultivate mindfulness, I mean, in meditation, I feel like from a very experiential point of view, you know, you, um, you experience an open space right? It's, it's, it's an open space. But when I, for example, um, chop the carrots, um, I can either chop the carrots and I, I can't do both. You know what I'm saying? I can't, I, I can't really be mindful and chop the carrots. I can say, for example, okay, I'm mindful chopping the carrots, but then I'm not 100% in chopping the carrots. Um, mm -hmm. For example, or that's why, or it's this example of when you are mindful, be like, um, be really in the here and now. But and and athletes would would call it to be in the zone. That's what they are always calling about, right? Being the zone. But this is often an absorption into into um, not in con to confusion, but you lose it. You know what I'm saying? You lose it when I watch TV. Even my, I lose it, which is again also in the zone. Do you like? Does it really? Does it make sense what I'm referring to a little bit, or is this too confusing? For example, you know, I can't read, and then at at the same time have the thought or be the thought. Hey, there is something that I, there's someone who is reading in this very moment. I have hmm. to stop reading. Hmm. Yeah, I hear yeah, you, you can't. You can't do both. You can't you can't be mindful and read a sentence. So let me uh, mm, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Good. No, no, no. I I I start repeating myself. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Connie's great got it, has a great question. And I want to use her great question to sort of uh, clarify a few things. So, for, and of course, this is all my, just my understanding in that way, based on my own practice in that sense. So Connie, the, the way that I think about it, another way that I think about this mindfulness thing that we're talking about, sati or shmurti, I always think about it as, and I've described this to many of you have heard me say this, but the way that I think about it is, is I kind of think about the mind as just like to think in terms of a visual representation. I kind of think of the mind as like a, a pie chart. And 
the idea is, is that every different thing that we are thinking about is like a piece of the pie chart. And then the whole of all the different things I have on my mind is like the totality of the pie chart. And the point is, is that we do, if we start, like, let's just start from a state of not being mindful. The idea is, is that we might have a lot on our mind. We even use that expression a lot. I've got a lot on my mind. And that means that we're juggling a lot of different ideas. And a lot of those ideas might be things from the past. A lot of those ideas might be things to come, like plan, making plans for the future. And then even in the present moment here, I could be aware of and mindful of a lot of different things, right? So the way that I describe it is if you think about your mind as a, as a pie chart, I see it as that there's a relationship between sort of the circumference of the circle of the pie chart and how many different things are on your mind. And the idea is, is that if you have a lot of different things on your mind, the circumference of your pie chart of the mind gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And it starts to feel really tight. Actually, it starts to feel as if it's about, I don't know, about that big. And then sometimes the mind can get even smaller where it feels like it's constricted deep inside. Whereas if I could just kind of let go of the past for a moment, don't worry about the future for a moment and really kind of be here in what I'm doing. Now, all I have to do is worry about these five, 10 things on my mind about the present. But as the pie chart gets less and less pieces, the circumference grows and grows. And if I can keep jettisoning different ideas, my mindfulness of that one thing gets very big because that's all I'm mindful of. I'm only mindful of this one thing. And therefore, 100% of my concentration mental power is going towards this one thing. So Connie, what I'm getting around to is that in terms of making dinner, chopping carrots, it's about being aware of, am I chopping carrots and thinking about what happened yesterday? Am I chopping carrots and thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow? In fact, am I chopping carrots and thinking about what I'm going to do next in, like, in preparation for cooking? Or am I just right here chopping the carrots? Pre like That's the only thing I'm doing. Now, Connie, I heard you getting into some, you know, kind of really deep stuff, which is this, like a really subtle distinction between reading and then being mindful of reading and sort of not being able to do those two different things at the same time. And that sounds to me like you might be thinking about samadhi and not sati or mindfulness. Now, samadhi is a few down the road of our list, so we're not going to get there for a second. But I do want to emphasize this. Mindfulness, or this kind of ability to focus the mind on kind of one thing, and, and Connie, this is the really important part. The main thing is, are you distractible? Or can you just stay focused on the chopping of the carrots and just be very present with that act activity? Now, if you were to slip into an entirely concentrated state, which it sounds like you were talking about, that would be slipping into a samadhi. And normally when we're in a samadhi, normally we are not doing anything because that would be too many different things. So there is just a state of concentrated awareness, 
without any kind of particular activity, even being mindful of the breath. So yeah, Connie. Yeah, I think, you know, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, I think the distinction is important. I think what it is, what is what I wanted to kind of convey is that mindfulness is for me, it is more than like how you explain it to me, what I'm hearing is a certain sense of focus and this is for me different to mindfulness for example we don't need to go now into the details just one one example with the reading um you know sometimes we get so much into reading and that you know again you can say you are in the zone you know because you're reading right you lose the sense of yesterday and tomorrow and the i but i wouldn't necessarily say that's mindfulness um in my understanding Um, For me, then you get, you know, you you enter, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's focused, but um, this is for me not mindful. Mindfulness is for me, you know, like when, as you just explained, so I'm chopping the, um, I'm chopping the carrots and then there's the sense of, then, then I zone out a little bit and yeah, yeah, it's, it's subtle. It's, it's very subtle. And obviously it's, it's, um, it's experiential and we just only have language which is, which is limited. But, um, I think I wanted, for me, it was important to make a distinction between mindfulness and focus. Um, but it's good that you brought in the Samadhi state and this the differentiation. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Connie. Yeah, and again, I do want to clarify, especially with where we're going, that be the, the ability to be mindful is for me ultimately about distractibility or not. Like, are you easily distracted and anything just draws your attention away from what you're doing? Or are you able to sort of not be distracted? And that is sort of an aspect of mindfulness. And that's sort of, that's one thing. The ability to move into a deep samadhi, a kind of concentration state that we're going to talk about in a moment, that's kind of a different thing in a way than being mindful. So again, and this is the idea where we only have this one word meditation in English, but the the, uh, science of this is much more nuanced in that way. All right, well, let's keep going because we only have uh, a little bit of time. And so let's talk about the next uh, factor of enlightenment, which is Dharma Vichaya, investigation of dharmas. So this is, another, you know, once again, this is either something that can get you enlightened or it's something an enlightened person does. And the idea of Dharma Vichaya is investigating dharmas, like looking into it. <laughs> now, you could you could understand this two different ways. You could either understand the dharmas that we are investigating as the teachings of the Buddha. You know, things like the Four Noble Truths, the Five Skandhas, you know, the dharma. So the second factor of awakening is this idea of investigating the teachings of the Buddha, investigating the Dharma, or you can interpret this actually just as investigating phenomena, investigating dharmas, as in stuff, investigating things. And the thing about it is, is that, so I often teach or I explain that Buddhism is such an interesting tradition because it's kind of one part meditation, one part science. You might call it a philosophy, you know, you might call it a number of things, but there's a way in which a lot of Indian yoga and meditation traditions They are just about meditation. They are about ultimately samadhi. And so ultimately it's about shutting down the karma factory and ultimately sort of 
checking out not not buddhism but a lot of indian yoga meditation traditions are about shutting down the karma machine and checking out the world the world is just like you know the world samsara so there's no reason to like study the world there's no reason to investigate the world just meditate so that's a lot of yoga traditions but buddhism's a little different because it's not just a meditation tradition now as i often like to point out there's a whole world of science there's a whole world of investigation and what I like to point out about Western, Western science in particular, but really it's modern science. Modern science says that your state of mind doesn't have anything to do with this. Meaning if I'm Galileo and I'm going to study gravity and I'm going to take my two different you know density objects and i'm gonna you know roll them down a hill to study terminal velocity the idea of science of like modern western-based science is that there's just the objective world and it doesn't have anything to do with my mind like the speed of the objects rolling down my in my experiment it doesn't have anything to do with my mind Galileo can, you know, show up to the the laboratory drunk and it doesn't matter because it because the science is about the world. It doesn't have anything to do with my mind. So that's just science, no meditation. I think Buddhism is interesting because it's one part meditation tradition, one part science one part investigation and so the second factor of enlightenment is ultimately looking into things investigating things poking around thinking wondering about what makes up the world what makes up my mind what makes up suffering what constitutes this and so the second factor of awakening is looking into things investigating dharmas and what I want you to be thinking about as far as the bell, the bell curve of awakening that I'm talking about, if we're thinking about the bell curve of awakening, then at one end is someone that doesn't care at all about, like, I don't care why things work. Just give me, just give me the money or just give me the food or just give me whatever. But I would say, or I, and I actually, I often like to say this, Vichaya, Dharma Vichaya, the Vichaya, it's translated as investigation of dharmas, but there seems to be a hint, a hint of curiosity in Vichaya. You need to be a little curious. You know, it's the kind of the mind, the kind of mind that kind of wants to know why things work and the kind of mind that would even take something apart to like look into it. The point is, from this Buddhist point of view, is that if you're going to get awakened, you need to be curious. You need to be investigative. You need to be looking into things. If you're kind of like not interested, if you don't care what's inside of it, if you don't care how it works, then that's kind of going to be a hindrance to the process of awakening because you kind of need to look into things in order to cultivate this type of mind. So at one end is, I don't care at all. Then there's the bell curve. So in the middle, there's the rest of us that are usually pretty interested in things. Usually, a lot of us are very curious about what's going on in the world. And then, all the way at the other end of the bell curve is a Buddha, an awakened one. And the thing that I kind of often like to mention is, is that, yes, 
investigation of dharmas is a requisite or a factor of awakening, but you can also look at it as a quality of an awakened person, which is, and this is the way that I kind of think of it. My feeling about an awakened person from this investigation of Dharma's point of view, it's someone that is always sort of open and still investigating versus a kind of stubborn mentality that says, ah, I've got it all figured out, everybody. I'm done. I'm done investigating. I've, I've, I've got it all figured out. Just ask me if you want to know what's going on. <laughs> versus, again, versus sort of always being curious, always investigating, always looking into things. So, again, you can look at it as a way to get enlightened or a quality of enlightenment, this kind of curious investigation of the world. Yeah. All right. Third factor is virya. Virya, uh, from which we get the English word kind of like a virility, this idea of energy, drive, motivation, uh, a kind of get up and go, right? And basically, the opposite of virya is laziness. The opposite of virya is I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> I'll, I'll meditate tomorrow. <laughs> you are never going to get awakened if it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> if you're, if you're going to be putting it off till tomorrow, then it's not going to happen. Whereas if you have virya, if you have this kind of drive and determination, that is a factor of awakening. And again, the idea is, is that it, it is either a factor that gets us awakened or someone who is awakened is full of energy, is full of drive in that way. Virya, by the way, virya is a requisite. It's a factor of awakening because, and this is the way it's kind of normally taught, there's a way in which virya and I, you know, I mentioned, I like to translate virya as drive, being driven. And the reason why I kind of, I prefer the translation of virya as drive or being driven. I've mentioned this one many times on Dharma doors, but it's the idea of like someone who, you know, gets up every morning and runs five miles and they have that, that drive or that determination to, to get up and do that. And the idea is, is that if somebody were to come along to that person and say, wow, you, you're getting up every morning and, and jogging five miles, you're going to run a marathon? You're trying to join the Olympics? Like, why are you doing this? Like, what's the goal? And if the person were to say, there is no goal. <laughs> I am just driven to get up every morning and do that. And the, and if the person were like, but, but you could just sleep in, <laughs> you could just stay in bed all morning. The per, this person that I'm thinking of would say, yeah, I guess I could stay in bed all morning, but I'm going to go jog because <laughs> I'm driven to go jog in that way. So I like to translate virya as drive because it's a kind of goalless energy. It's a kind of just an energy to do things in that way. And virya, it's considered like the drive to be mindful, the drive to investigate, the drive to do the practice. So there's a way in which virya complements the other factors of awakening. And that in a way, virya is the get up and go, the energy or the drive that propels us into doing those other things in that way. 
And so without that, without the, the, the virya, if one were lazy, it would sort of be like, again, it would be like, well, I'll meditate tomorrow and I'll invest, oh, I'll investigate the dharmas tomorrow too. I'll put that on my list. So <laughs> yeah, Noe. Noe, oh, there you go. Here we go. Thank you. I just want to say, I think that should be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> it, it, I, think, I think for me, it was the first one. It, it was the idea of investigation mm. 40 years ago. It's like, what is that? When I met the person who meditated or talked about meditation or talked about this this way, it, it was the motivation that now has led me to here. So I think it should be the first. You can't do any of this without that. But, uh, thank you for Excellent. reminding us. Thank you, Noe. Yeah, and again, it's a certain, you know, it's a certain mentality that's curious about the world, that's curious about their own mind, that's curious about all of this, and that's a requisite. You have to be curious in that way. All right. Fourth factor of enlightenment is called in Sanskrit, kriti, or just piti in, in Pali, and it's usually translated as joy. Now, you need to know, or you should know, that within the world of Buddhism, pritti or pitti, it has a, it's not like, it's, it's joy, but it's a particular joy, all right? And, and, and this is sort of the traditional understanding of this, by the way. And what it is, is, is that when you hear this term pritti, when you hear this term pitti, they are generally referring to the joy of the first dhyana, the joy of the first jhanic state, which is marked by priti, this kind of joy, or it even sometimes gets translated as rapture. Like it's joy. And some people think it's like more rapture joy. Other people are like, no, it's more like just pleasant delight. <laughs> So it kind of depends on who you talk to. But there's a particular kind of way that I think about this joy. And what it is, is that if you consider that it is usually this particular type of joy, pretty, is associated with being in a jhana. And if you remember or you know that a jhana or a dhyana is a meditative state in which one is abiding in what is called just the realm of form, just the realm of things in terms of their shape, density, size, number, nothing to get worked up about, nothing to get excited about and nothing really to crave in that way. Cravings are all part of the realm of desire. You know, things that are pretty or things that are cool or things that are, you know, all of these different ideas. Whereas when you get into a dhyana, the idea is, is that you're just dealing with different degrees of density. <laughs> and so there's not a lot to get excited about. But that state of being in a kind of muted realm of pure form, that uh, being in that state is said, and my experience is that it elicits this joy, this pretty. And my experience of that joy is that it is the joy that comes from independence. It's the joy that comes from actually for, for once in one's life, not needing anything, not being plagued by desire, actually being happy, being pleased, and being pleased by just being, for lack of a better term. And so this particular thing, pretty or pity, it's about that, the joy that comes from these meditative states, which are free in that way. So 
That's the joy. Now, I do want to say, though, that although it is traditionally understood as being the meditative joy of the dhyanas, you could also just understand that a factor of enlightenment is joyfulness. No matter, in a way, no matter how you come across it in that sense. And at that point, then, again, I want to br bring, bust out my bell curve. And I want to talk about all the way down at this end is just utter suffering all the time. Negative mind state. Everything is terrible all the time. That's at this end of the bell curve. Most of us, hopefully, are in the middle of the bell curve where we have a kind of a mix, good times and bad times in that way. Whereas on this end of the bell curve, a Buddha, an awakened one, always in a state of joy. And that's another kind of thing that I guess I wanted to, when I, at the beginning of the Dharma talk this evening, when I said I kind of wanted to demystify the Buddha, but also simultaneously mystify the Buddha. So we're talking about someone who is mindful, curious, full of energy, and joyful. And my point is, is that that does not actually sound like an unachievable, unattainable goal. It does not sound like flying to other planets. It does not sound like anything miraculous. It sounds like being mindful, being joyful, being full of energy, like these types of things, which again are totally understandable. So that's sort of demystifying the Buddha. But then the idea of sort of being ever joyful, that might sound a little bit like, whoa. Really? But as we kind of have been studying, or and especially the last portion of the sutra that we've been looking at, we've been looking at the way that the Buddha deals with these unfortunate events. And that from the point of view, from the point of view of the Buddha, they are not unfortunate events. They are not. They are not good. They're not bad. They are what happened. They are such, as we might say in the Buddhist tradition. And what I want to kind of say is, is that the joy that is being described here, because it's a joy that comes from this kind of letting go in that sense, the idea is, is that regarding this, like regarding this thing in the world, regarding that thing in the world, neither good nor bad, very neutral, very equanimous in that sense. And so everything out, everything in that way is very even, equi equanimous. But the point is, is that being in that state of mind that is equanimous towards everything is joyful internally. So I don't want to make it sound like the, everything is great in the life of a Buddha. It's not about the externals and everything being great. It's that the mind state of a Buddha is one of being joyful all the time. But again, not because they're getting everything they want in that way, but because their mental attitude towards the world is equanimous, in that sense. All right. Next up. So then this is the one this is probably the one of the seven factors that you may have heard the least about. It's the one, at least it's the one technical term, which is prashrab dehi. This is one that you might not have heard. Prashrab dehi is translated as tranquility, a kind of um, contentment in a way. But there's a very, I, I just learned this uh, yesterday or today, I forget, but in doing research for tonight's Dharma talk, I just kind of discovered a more uh, official definition of prashrabdhi. And 
it's a very interesting one. So it is this kind of tranquility, but it's a very particular one, which is, it is the feeling of being relieved of the weight of the body and the weight of the mind. But particularly, it is about not being burdened by the weight of the body. And what they describe prashrabdhi as, as a, they describe it as a lightness of being. This kind of, yeah, a, a lightness of being marked by feeling free and at ease. And I just want to mention this because there's a, a word, there's a technical term in Buddhism, uh, Mahayana Buddhism in particular, and this is only for those of you out there who have studied some of this stuff. If you haven't, just hold on for a second. But in some of the Mahayana sutras, there's a word called stula, S-T-H-U-L-A. And stula is translated as coarse heaviness. And what they talk about in these sutras that describe the coarse heaviness of samsara is they then talk about being alleviated of the coarse heaviness of the body and then being established in this prashrabdhi. And so I just kind of want you to be thinking about that that that's kind of, it, it means tranquility, but it particularly has this feeling of a lightness of being. And now, once again, I want to look at our bell curve. <laughs> and I actually, let's start just with the middle of the bell curve. So I know for me, as someone who abides in the middle of the bell curve there, I know that for me, my mental state can greatly affect <laughs> how my shoulders feel. I might not be the only one, but there's a way in, you know, we even have this expression in English. The expression is feeling as if I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. And my point is, is that there are mental states, ones of depression, sadness, in which you feel heavy, literally physically heavy, where it's like kind of literally hard to stand up. It's like a heaviness of being. But I can also remember especially, you know, when I was younger and so my, some of my first experiences of like falling in love and like going on, you know, after my, like a, a, one of, a first big date and literally kind of feeling like, I, you know, was walking on clouds in that way, a very kind of lightness of being because of my mental state. So that's the bell curve. And of course, down at one end, we have the very sad state of being of just feeling always burdened, just it always feeling heavy and never having any relief, like never having even a moment of feeling light. Then there's all of us in the middle of the bell curve that have moments of heaviness, moments of lightness. And then down at this end of the bell curve is a Buddha that they say can even levitate. Now, to talk about the superpower, to talk about the siddhi of levitation, can they really levitate? Or are they just so free in mind that it feels like they're levitating? I don't know. Once again, be a good Buddhist and don't come down too hard on one side of, you know, no, they cannot levitate, or yes, they can levitate, absolutely. But my point is, is that to think of it that way, the heaviness of being versus a lightness of being, and that we have all, hopefully, I pray that we have all had at least brief moments of the experience of that lightness of being, 
and then just noticing that the lightness could increase. Like that could become more of the norm in that way. And then of course, you would then put that together with being joyful, being full of energy, being driven, being investigative and being mindful in that way. And then after all of that, then we get to samadhi. So samadhi is what we were talking about earlier, especially in reference to Connie's uh, uh, question. So samadhi is a meditative state. And because of time, I just kind of want to give you the bullet points here. In most worlds of meditation, Buddhism included, in most worlds of meditation, a samadhi, a defining characteristic of a samadhi is a non-dual experience. Otherwise, you could say a samadhi is an experience of the dissolution of the self, the breaking down of the subject-object relationship. That is the normal definition of being in a samadhi. So normally, of course, you would then do a form of sati. You would do a form of mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breathing, focusing on the body, focusing on a candle flame, whatever it is, you would establish that fixed focused awareness, the mindfulness on an object again, or the breathing. And then through a sustained period of mindfulness, there can eventually be a, a blurring, a blurring and a dissolution of the I am meditating on the candle flame. And the idea is, is that through a sustained practice of mindfulness, there can be a dissolution of the subject object relationship and then a feeling of oneness. And so when there is a feeling of being one, it could be one with everything, or it could just be a feeling of oneness with my object of meditation. But whatever it is, there's a feeling of unity or oneness, no longer being me and it. It's just me, but it wouldn't be an egotistical sense of it's all me. Because again, dissolution of the self experience in that way. So a samadhi is this state of no subject and object. And once again, and, and again, that's sort of the standard definition. Various teachers and various schools have more nuanced definitions of samadhi, but that's kind of a, you know, a basic definition. And what I would mention is, is I'd say again, these seven factors of awakening, you can think about them as either things that get you awakened or aspects of awakening. And so the idea is, is that it is about exposure to samadhi states. So doing a form of sati, doing a form of mindfulness, then bringing about that samadhi experience. And then one idea is that repeated exposures to a samadhi experience brings about a state of awakening. But you could also understand that to be awakened is to be always in samadhi, which is to say, always in a state of oneness, always in a state of unity, never being in a state of me, and you in that sense. And so a defining definition of a Buddha, of an awakened being, is exactly that. One that is in a state of samadhi all the time and is therefore, again, in a very unique state of mind where they are not perceiving a separation between themselves and the world in that sense. And more, maybe more importantly, 
not seeing a distinction or a differentiation between themselves and the other and others in that way. Okay, questions about samadhi? I know I kind of moved through that one pretty quickly. All right, so last and final factor of awakening is upeksha. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of class tonight that upeksha is normally translated as equanimity. And although that is sort of a quality of upeksha, for tonight, I want you to kind of know that a more official definition of upeksha is about relinquishment. And it basically has to do with, well, if you know your noble truths, if you know about upadana, clinging, attachment, this idea that the upadana, the appropriating, or again, clinging attachment, if you understand the Four Noble Truths, which says that very holding on is what is creating dukkha, the suffering, then to let go is upeksha. Now, the reason why it gets translated as equanimity is because one who has let, let go in that way one who is in upeksha, in a state of relinquishment, they're not attached. They're not clinging. Now, once again, you can practice upeksha. Every, basically, every time you sit in meditation, you are practicing upeksha because you are choosing not to watch TV, not to listen to something, not to eat, not to smell things, not to take a warm bath, not to play Sudoku and exercise your mind. You are choosing to not do anything. So that is upeksha, and you are practicing it. Because when you're sitting in meditation, you might want to go watch TV, you might want to go do something else, but insofar as you continue to practice, you are practicing upeksha. So that is thinking about these as factors of that factors that lead to awakening. Or you could understand that a state of awakening, a Buddha, an awakened being, is relinquished. They have let go in that way. And of course, upeksha isn't just about relinquishing my stuff. Upeksha is about relinquishing even that attachment to the illusory idea of the self that we talk about a lot here on the Dharma doors. But that's also, not also, but that is a very important aspect of upeksha is that even relinquishing of that delusion of self in that way. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I will mention this on Upeksha. In the early Buddhist tradition, and I don't particularly, as you may know, and I should say this more often, I don't ascribe to the early Buddhist tradition. <laughs> I, I don't ascribe to those exact practices in that way. So I want to say that ahead of time. I'm much more of a Mahayana Buddhist myself. But in the early form of Buddhism, upeksha would be translated as indifference. And there is a way in which early Buddhism is kind of a cultivation of indifference in that way. Whereas the bodhisattva path is not based on indifference. It's definitely not. And so within the Mahayana tradition and the bodhisattva path, there's a different understanding of upeksha that is not exactly like that. Yeah, Noam. Uh, thank you, Michael. This is great. Uh, okay. <laughs> I am wondering why you're not describing the investigation 
of dharmas as uh, as like equ equating it with vipassana mm. i should have done that already yeah it is that yeah yeah in fact my whole spiel about buddhism is one part meditation one part science that's called shamatha vipassana like for me vipassana is about a kind of inquiry and then insight and okay because a lot of, of teachers say that vipassana and and, and shamatha are two types of meditation oh sure sure either way oh i see what you're saying yeah 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 and of course this whole my thing about just words <laughs> yeah they're just words it, it's about a way that i teach buddhism in that way it's an upaya for the for the science people okay right trying to get the scientific people involved in this but yeah so i'm talking about vipassana which vipassana is about inquiry exactly it is dharma vichaya yeah. in that okay. sense but yeah i just per, I approach Vipassana as a type of scientific investigation in that way. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Noam. Uh yeah, uh Connie. Just a short question. Samadhi. Yeah. Um, would you define samadhi more um between um hold on? I think I lost it. Hold on. Between mm -hmm. oh there yes, now I have it. Um a state of mind or resting in the nature of mind um given those choices i would definitely go resting in the nature of mind cool, cool. yeah Thank state you. of mind there would still be somebody that with the mind mm -hmm. that is different than whatever objects at least that's the way i would understand that language but mm -hmm. Yeah, because I just Googled it because like what came up for me was Samadhi was no mind. And then that's how I came to the question. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And, you know, um, oh, well, the, actually, this will tie into my last remarks, unless there's any other questions or comments. Yeah. So my concluding remarks are about how I want us to sort of think about the seven, these seven factors of enlightenment. And it is not always taught this way. Again, there's different teachers, different schools of thought. But for me, these seven factors are not mutually exclusive. So what I mean is, is that for me, a Buddha, an awakened being, is all seven of these. And they are kind of what would mean that they are a fully awakened being is that these are these seven modes are locked in. They, we are not moving back to the other end of the bell curve anymore. And so, again, it's about thinking about somebody who is mindful versus mindless, somebody who is curious versus indifferent, doesn't care in that way about how things work, right? Somebody who is driven versus someone who is lazy, someone that is joyful versus someone that is not joyful in that way, someone that is light and tranquil, not stressed out, worried and heavy, <laughs> someone who is focused and concentrated, and perhaps even in a fully non-dual state versus someone that is, it's me against the world, right? Like that's the mentality. Put them up. Let, like, let's do this, right? So that kind of mentality that it's me against the world, that's over at this end of the bell curve versus resting in the nature of mind, be over here at this end of the bell curve. And a Buddha is one who is not attached to or clinging in that way, whereas down here are all the clinging in that way. And so I would encourage you to kind of think about all seven of those. And my main goal tonight, again, was to kind of present all of that as attainable, <laughs> not 
ex like not super extraordinary. And the way that I wanted to present it with my bell curve was to show or speak about how, again, hopefully, we've all had experiences of these seven things. They might have been fleeting moments of them, but we've had a taste. And so the idea is, is about recognizing what brought about the taste of these seven things. And then they call it practice. They call it cultivation and further developing the practice further developing the things that brought about these seven things. And the idea is, is eventually they can become the default mode in that sense. So, all right, we didn't get back to Kashepa, but hopefully all the gods in the audience clarified their Dharma eyes from this uh, treatment of the seven factors of awakening. <laughs> Yay. All right, everybody, that's it for me.